what is going on? What's going on, guys? This is the Wolf of Roto Street, of course, of RotoStreetJournal.com, here to give you a in-depth breakdown of the 2018 NFL trade deadline. I'm going to be looking back and forth because I'm trying to do both Instagram right here and the Facebook right here. So I'm going to try to hit both channels. So stick with me. I'm going to be covering all the major trade deadline news. And there's tons of it. Tons of receiver movement with Demarius Thomas going to Houston. Golden Tate going to Detroit. There's tons of movement going on today uh, with humongous implications both for these guys and their new homes, uh, but also the players, places they leave behind. So again, I'm going to have my phone in one hand, computer on the other. If you prefer Facebook, check us out on Facebook. I got the menu all that going uh, but if you like instagram i'm right here it's my first time trying this out so welcome to the show cade and, and willie willie applesauce good to see you man grizzly joe uh, we got chris jason on the facebook let's get going let's get right into the news and of course ask me any questions you have um to go along with all this good stuff First and foremost was Demarius Thomas. We're going to go in kind of chronological order here. Uh, and he was traded to the Houston Texans. Of course, the Texans just losing Will Fuller on Thursday night football. Torn ACL, humongous wide receiver need, and they fill the void to perfection. They add Demarius Thomas. Now, granted, Thomas is a shed of what he used to be. He used to be one of the best yak receivers in the league. He's only averaging 3.7 yards after catch this year. So soft vegan man uh, is, is not nearly what we once had. But still, he's doing okay. He's graded out as the number 33 receiver from Pro Football Focus. I don't love the guy. Again, vegan loser. Uh, but ultimately, I'm still okay with this move. Going from Case Keenum to friggin' Deshaun Watson, an amazing upgrade for Demarius Thomas. It was just a joke having to catch passes from Keenum. He was still doing okay. But now he goes to Deshaun Watson, one of the more explosive offenses with the Texans. Uh, we've seen Watson throw for over 375 yards on four different occasions this year. So he's going to step in and get a lot more action and a much more explosive offense. So Demarius, I like much more in his new home uh, with Houston. But what this really matters to me, the biggest implication of this move, um, Demarius, to uh, Houston is what he leaves behind there in Denver. For one, uh, and this we're going to move to the next note, Broncos wide receivers in the aftermath. Oh, and I guess Houston, we can keep talking real quick. I don't think this impacts Demarius all that much. Uh, he's still going to be... Uh, I mean, DeAndre Hopkins, his usual self, he's a beast. He doesn't, competition for targets doesn't exist for this guy. He's always going to be a monster. Who it really impacts, though, is Kiki Cutie. Uh, that, that hurts him a big deal. He was going to be one of the top targets on the waiver wire this week, Kiki was. Uh, and now you can't, you can't really uh, trust him anymore. Um, it, it's going to be a tough, tough go for him uh, with much more competition for targets there. It uh, looks like we're reconnecting on, on Instagram, so I'll stick to the Facebook. I have no idea what's going on there. Um, reconnecting. Hopefully this reconnects. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, we're back. Um, so again, Kiki QT, by far the most negatively impacted guy here. Um, it, it sucks for him. He goes from one of the most popular wave wire targets of the week to now being a guy you can't really look for. Um, turn your... What does CJ say in here? Turn? I, I, I don't even know. Um, either turn your Wi-Fi off on IG. Alrighty. I don't know what's going on. Oh, I got you. I got you. Turned it off. Good good idea, CJ. Sorry, guys. This is, again, my first time doing the IG and the uh, the Facebook at once, but hopefully you guys are still watching on both platforms. Uh, but again, Kiki QT, 20% owned, was going to be one of the hottest waiver wire pickups of the week. At this point now, he's better left off just waiting there with so many other hut names. DJ Moore, the easiest cakewalk schedule to finish the season, the easiest uh, of schedules out there. So I, I love DJ Moore more, much more than I would say Kiki QT, especially in this movement. And I also like uh, as the menu on Facebook suggests we're talking now about the the Broncos wide receivers aftermath I much prefer more than any other wide receiver uh, Cortland Sutton. Cortland Sutton now becomes the clear-cut number two guy in this Denver attack. Yes, I just was kind of shitting on Case Keenum, but when he's only spreading the ball to Emmanuel Sanders and then Cortland Sutton, I mean, Sutton's been playing okay. 8.8, 7.3. 
uh, eight, nine point three, nine point three over his last four is the the clear cut number three guy. Serviceable numbers. That's acceptable flex numbers for a lot of you guys during bye week hell. And those numbers should take a significant spike forward. Now, uh, again, with this target share now much more his with Demaris Thomas's presence removed. So that's big news for uh, for our guy Cortland Sutton. He's got to be the top waiver wire pickup of the week. Only 13% owned right now. He's got to be the first guy you're looking at. I'll dump him out. Thanks, Dan and, and Joe for the kiss. Appreciate that. Um, but that, that would be the biggest guy impacted here. Cortland Sutton, a major riser in light of Demarius Thomas getting sent to Houston. Uh, Matt Milliken, the only, Thomas' only deal that has big increase in value? No, we're going to talk about Golden Tate's deal in a second. Uh, and that has some wide-ranging impacts on certain players that you must know. Uh, so we'll get there in a second. But the last guy just to mention real quick is, of course, Emmanuel Sanders. He already was the clear-cut number one target there, the number eight wide receiver in fantasy. And now he's about to see even more targets. Just more reason to love uh, Emmanuel Sanders moving forward. He already was a true dominant wide receiver one. Um, let's move to our next major trade, though, as Matthew Milliken uh, kind of prompts here, a good segue for us, to Golden Tate going to Philadelphia. Uh, huge, huge news over there. One of the best yards after the catch, catch wide receivers. receivers. Just a, a talented, physical guy uh, overall. Just love Golden Tate. Great weapon. They give up a third round pick. Pretty steep price for just an eight game rental. So it goes to show they really value this guy. Maybe trying to work out a long term deal here with Golden Tate. Uh, so he's going to, to Philadelphia, and the, the impacts, again, are humongous, considering, one, how explosive Carson Wentz in this offense generally is, and then, two, how the, the Lions offense has been very pass-heavy and tons of volume is now opened up for some really talented guys back in Detroit. But let's stick to Philly for a little while uh, and, and figure out what is going to happen here with Golden Tate. What is this offense going to look like now with this humongous new wide receiver addition? Well, one, Wentz is already playing lights-out ball. He looks fully back to health after his ACL, and now he gets a another borderline elite weapon, especially out of the slot, maybe the best slot yards after the catch guy in the NFL added to his arsenal. I mean, that's a no-brainer. That's just Wentz value continues to go and climb and climb and climb. Uh, he's been over 20 fantasy points and think every single start since his first one back. This guy is going to be a beast. Wentz has to have as much respect and fantasy as those elite quarterbacks at this point above Kirk Cousins, in my opinion. He'll be up in my top six to five QBs moving forward uh, with this weapons cabinet. And it just kind of goes and underscores they made no moves in the backfield. Clement's been garbage. Josh Adams looked pretty decent, but Wendell Small, I mean, this backfield got no injections of any type of talent. It's going to be a pass first. Already was a pass first. Now it's going to be a pass obsessed offense. Uh, you imagine Wentz is just going to be chucking the rock all over the place. What about you know Golden Tate himself? What's his value here? Well, one, you got to learn a new playbook, and Doug Peterson's offense is not the simplest offense. Uh, so there's going to be a lot to learn here for Golden Tate. So there's going to be some growing pains. He's going to have to get acclimated. And the middle of the field's already pretty competitive for targets. We've got Zach Ertz running 75% of his routes in between the numbers. Golden Tate runs 70% of his routes inside the numbers. Um, so ultimately... That middle of the field becomes quite a bit more congested. We got Aguilar already a slot guy too. What's going to happen to him? Well, Aguilar to me is cuttable at this point. He's gone, only gone for 50 yards. Uh, he's gone been under 50 yards in six, uh, five of his last six. So he's only topped 50 yards in one game. Uh, he's never been over double-digit fantasy points except that one time topping 50 yards. Uh, so you don't love. Aguilar's value at this point. He's cuttable, in my opinion. Too many mouths to feed, and he's going to be the first one out. I can see him running plenty of four wide receiver sets, which could make some uh, money happen on those deep balls with a lot of attention away from him, but it's going to be way too unpredictable. I don't like Aguilar at all, um, but... Ertz, we just mentioned him and, and, and Tate competing for that middle of the field. Again, Ertz, 75% of his routes in between the numbers. Uh, Golden Tate, 70% of his routes in between the numbers. That's going to be some tough competition uh, right there. So how's that going to shake out? It can't be great. I mean, Ertz already is dominating tight end targets over 10 a game right now for Zach Ertz, which is by far and away the most. Travis Kelsey, almost two less targets per game. That number is going to now get more in line with Kelsey, maybe seven and a half, which is Ertz's career type of numbers uh, is seven and a half or so targets. That's where I see his, his 10, you know, his massive target share he has sliding down just a little bit with Golden Tate now sharing that middle of the field. His value takes a little bit of a hit. 
hit, but nothing crazy. This guy is still a top three guaranteed locked in tight end each week. Uh, so don't go overboard d- downgrading him. Uh, what does it mean for Alshon Jeffrey? I-, I actually don't hate this move for Jeffrey. They play two completely different positions, run two completely different route trees. Uh, I think both of those guys uh, sustain a similar value. Alshon Jeffrey, obviously his target share goes down a little bit, so now he goes from the the one, the number one receiver uh, he's been, to maybe more of a high-end number two. Uh, we'll see how that shakes out, but ultimately I don't think he's too hurt, and maybe even less defensive attention helps him out a little bit. Uh, so uh, summarize that again, Aguilar, now cuttable in my opinion, just useless, uh, just you know under 50 yards in all but one game over his last six, and now it's going to be even worse. you got to cut that guy. Ertz will be impacted. They're going to share that middle of the field. A uh, slight downgrade, but nothing to go over the top with. Uh, Golden Tate himself, some growing pains. Takes a pretty significant upgrade as that you know number one guy he was for a little bit. Now now he slides into learning a new playbook, having to get acclimated with more weapons around him. I think he'll settle into a nice PPR wide receiver too. This this offense is predicated on the run after the catch, those quick hitters. Uh, he'll, he'll fit in perfectly. They clearly, again, coveted him to give up a third-round pick for just an eight-game rental. So he'll have a clear role. It might just take a little bit. They thankfully have their bye week to kind of acclimate him and get him used to this offense. Um, I think Tate still is a quality wide receiver too with a slight downgrade. And Alshon Jeffrey, just a little bit of a downgrade too there. Carson Wentz, of course, getting a huge stock up. And this running game, just nobody there to note anyways. Uh, you can keep ignoring this running game. It's only going to become more pass-centric. Now, on the other side of the ball uh, of this trade, the Lions. What's the aftermath there? Well, we've seen you know, Baby Tron, uh, our boy, Kenny Galladay, just absolutely explode to begin this year. Was the number 15 wide receiver in half PPR for those first five weeks, averaging almost 15 points per game. Was a monster. A.J. Green comparables. The size, the speed, the ability to leap over defenders. you got to love everything. that His nickname's Babytron for a reason. This guy goes up and gets it. Kenny Galladay is now going to be unshackled, unleashed. Probably the clear-cut number one uh, there. So, Matt, you were asking, you know, any other clear-cut value increases? I'd say Kenny Galladay, huge stock up arrow, and Marvin Jones as well, a guy that I think it's a significant boost, fresh off a 27-point fantasy day. Marvin Jones now even less competition for targets with that hog, Golden Tate removed. Uh, both those guys, tremendous stock up arrows uh, in this pe- pe- um, this Detroit offense that, yes, it has become a little more run heavy, but still, they featured three plus wide receivers on 75% of their plays. They love to air it out. They rank in the top 12 in terms of pass run ratio that you know maybe the sneaky benefactor here is carry on johnson and they do continue to transition to this more run-based attack we've seen that uh quite a bit they're feeding carry on a little bit more and his value has been going up uh but ultimately i I still think the biggest booster of course is kenny galladay marvin jones those two wide receivers they do get a little bit more uh run run heavy sure it helps carry john johnson out just a little bit but those two are the clear names to watch it is a wonder though you know 75 percent of their snaps again three plus wide receivers who will fill that third wide receiver spot is it tj jones is he a new penny stock to track he's made some plays when he afforded the opportunity tj jones as riddick moved into the slot be intriguing to see who's going to fill that now slot role that golden tate uh, uh unleashes here and leaves wide open it's vacated who knows who's going to fill in uh but we'll, we'll have to track that one and see either way again galladay marvin jones the biggest ones matt murray i agree the hairless bailey what a pathetic loser get you a quick wave what's going on buddy uh great comment bailey still has no hair hopefully he's tuning in there um have you got any questions, though, about these Lions receivers, about these Eagles receivers? Or, of course, we just talked about the Texans, uh, the aftermath there, and the, the Denver aftermath. Let me know. Those are the big wide receiver moves and by far the biggest moves of the trade deadline. We still have a couple more to cover. i got a couple questions here on the Facebook uh, Matthew Milliken, middle of the field, crowded, worried for me. Tate moves outside. Routes could be a little easier to get acclimated. Uh, he's just such a good slot guy, though. That's a, that's not his game, Matt. It's He's been a, a slot guy through and through his whole career, even at Notre Dame. That's really where he played and dominated. So, no, I, I don't see him getting moved to the outside and trying to get easier acclimated or any of that. I think he stays where he is, and I agree. It is crowded. It worries me. Uh, him and Ertz are going to maybe eat each other's cheese a little bit. Um, so that does hurt. Yes, I agree. But ultimately, they're both so talented, and I think Wentz is talented enough to sustain so many products here that they all will be, uh, you know, benefit from each other's presence, especially Wentz. He's just going to explode. 
Pete Gonzo. The trade today helped Hopkins write more single coverage. You know, I, I don't think his value was going to change regardless. He might have had more targets coming in, uh, Pete, if if they didn't have Demarius there, but also the quality of those targets, like you mentioned, do increase because of the single coverage. But he was getting that single coverage with Fuller anyways, uh, Fuller taking that lid off the defense. You know, I, I don't think his coverage in the packages defenses roll out will be all that much different uh, with with Demarius as compared to Fuller. In fact, Fuller had that deep speed to you know more aptly take that lid off and afford Hopkins those single coverages. Whereas Demarius doesn't get deep anymore. He's an intermediate guy. Uh, you know, he's it helps him sure in, in a little bit, but I don't think it helps him more than any more than what we saw with Will Fuller. Uh, forgot about Galladay and KJ. Uh, yeah, so exactly. I think you're you're applying um, th- those two definitely some great winners. Got to jump off for a meeting. All right, man. Appreciate you tuning in, Gonzo. Hopefully that helps. Uh, last guy to talk about here. Not nearly exciting as Tate or or as uh, Demarius Thomas, but Ty Montgomery. Uh, it, it is definitely an important move because, for one, where he leaves behind, that's probably the more significant move. But Montgomery could carve himself a significant role here. We've seen Buck Allen have some very, very useful fantasy days here with the Ravens. Uh, disgustingly so. He gets a lot of goal line volume, gets a lot of receiving volume, and he's not good at either. Montgomery's kind of like a souped-up uh, Buck Allen on steroids. So, I mean, if they decide to give Ty Montgomery the Buck Allen role, then Montgomery could have that you know low end RB two definitely usable flex value moving forward. However, if it becomes you know now a three headed nightmare and it's Collins and it's Buck Allen and it's Montgomery, ah uh, then fuck like none of them are gonna have value. It's gonna be too unpredictable. Collins maybe when he gets touchdowns and that's about it type of guy. Uh, so it, it remains definitely a wait and see. But for somebody who's largely out there in you ninety know, percent of leagues right now in Montgomery, it's worth a stab if you got the bench trash. You might as well pick him up, see what happens, see what he gets you what that role ends up being because again I think he's much better of a player than Buck Allen and if he inherits that role and kind of sends Buck Allen to the trash heap then that's going to be a very valuable fantasy role Uh, so just track Montgomery how he lands definitely worth a stash Um, in the light of all these news again the first guy I'm adding is Cortland Sutton no doubt about it Uh, but Montgomery becomes a waiver wire guy you can look to as well um and so, again, could be a three-headed nightmare, disgusting situation. But what does he leave behind? The Packers fall out. Well, we got one less mouth to feed both in the air because Montgomery has been a heavy-used pass catcher, but also on the ground. Obviously, they lose a running back here out of there. And, and you know, Jamal Williams is still there. But for me, this could be a huge development for Aaron Jones. Uh, the more explosive, clearly, not even close, of the two backs they have there. Uh, between Williams and Jones, and I think Aaron Jones, he's fresh off a season-high 32 snaps. Uh, He's kind of already moving towards that takeover. We saw Montgomery only in on six snaps and clearly fucked it up when he was in there. Uh, So we already saw this takeover start to happen. Aaron Jones taking 12 carries for 86 and a touchdown. The guy is clearly the best playmaker, and maybe this trade just is that move to fully let him out of the cage and let him rumble. I can see it happening. Uh, he's had the talent. He's done it before. But I also, for whatever reason, whether Mike McCarthy sees some of Jamal Williams in his own plodding ass, or whatever it might be, has always kept this guy involved. He vultured a touchdown last week. So I wouldn't just suddenly say, oh, Aaron Jones, RB1, lock him in. But still, it's got to be considered a positive development to have one less mouth there. And the wide receivers, too. Definitely a just complete clusterfuck of wide receivers behind Devontae Adams. We talked about this on our last fantasy fullback dive. Uh, there's no way you can trust any of those wide receivers not named Devontae Adams. It's just been such a mess uh, all over the place with uh, Van Scantling coming in and playing out of this world. He's playing great. Now Geronimo Allison suddenly is relegated to the number four and Cobb has the lowest snaps but catches 40 yards. It's disgusting. Maybe Randall Cobb takes some backfield snaps too. You never know. You can't put anything past this Mike McCarthy loser. Um, but ultimately, in my opinion, it definitely helps out Aaron Jones and we'll, we'll see how that goes. Alrighty, guys, 
that's pretty much it in terms of the moves. If you got any questions, let me know. Uh, just a rapid fire recap for any of you guys tuning in late and just catching up with us. Uh, we got Demarius Thomas sent to the Texans, uh, filling that huge gaping void that was left by Will Fuller's ACL tear. Definitely different players, so they'll fill different roles. But Demarius has a, a healthy path to targets. That was one of the most wide open target totem poles, with only really uh, Will Will Fuller being the. I mean. Um, Kiki QT and DeAndre Hopkins there. Uh, we got a request to be in the video. I've never done this yet. Let's try it out. Go live with Soul TV. I don't know what that means, but we're trying it out. Um, so again, we got Demarius Texans. His value definitely gets a stock up arrow, in my opinion, playing with Deshaun Watson instead of Case Keenum. Uh, yes, DeAndre Hopkins. What's up, Saul? Hey, Nick. What's hey, going on? Time. Yeah. I had a quick question. Send it in. No, I got gotcha. you. Yep, got gotcha. All right, I got a quick question. So one, I wanted to make sure that Hopkins, that his value didn't plummet too bad. No, um, I have Fuller. I had Fuller um, and Hopkins. Um, so I don't know what Hopkins' deal is. And the mm -hmm. second question is, Carlos Hyde, can I drop him yet? Um, <laughs> because I am so pissed about that trade. But I'll hang up. I'll listen to it. I appreciate it, man. Absolutely, great questions. Great questions. Uh, so those, those of you on Facebook. I don't know if you could hear that question, but we had Matt Sully calling in asking, um, what is this impact on Hopkins? Is this going to be a negative for Hopkins with Demarius Thomas going there? Um, and then he also asked, can he finally cut Carlos Hyde's useless ass? Uh, so let's answer the first one. I don't think this hurts Hopkins at all. In fact, it probably helps him in the long run. Yes, he would have had more volume with Will Fuller removed, but defenses could just key off on this guy, double, triple teams, if he didn't have a, an outside threat, another presence near him. So no, I don't think this hurts Hopkins. Uh, if anything, it might help the guy, even if the targets go down a little bit, the quality of those targets jump up significantly by having Demarius. No, he's not the lid lifter that Will Fuller would have been, uh, but still definitely commands defensive attention. So this does not hurt Hopkins in the least, in my opinion. I, I think he needed an outside presence around him. If somebody is hurt, it's Kiki QT. That guy, uh, his value went from being the now the number two to then going back to the trash heap number three. Injured, hamstring, not something I'm trying to worry about at this point. Uh, Thomas's skill set resembles QT much more than Fuller's did. I see his volume taking a serious hit. Uh, in terms of the second question, can you cut Carlos Hyde? Oh, man, it depends who's out there, but yes, I, I wouldn't be opposed to it. What's he going to be coming back to after week 10? We got Fournette returning. We got Yeldon as the clear-cut receiving back. So we're looking at the number three used running back in an offense that's not that great anyways. I'm not loving Carlos Hyde's value moving forward. Now, granted, Fournette comes back, his hamstring flares up, and then suddenly Hyde's right back into that lead back role. He's only had a couple weeks. So I wouldn't be necessarily frustrated by the fact that he hasn't had big games. He just got there. He's still learning the playbook. He's only in unlimited packages. Game flow wasn't there for the one game he was playing. Uh, so if Fournette flared up, then he'd be a, he'd be a money RB, you know, high end RB2. Ultimately, though, Fournette's had so long to get healthy. you got to imagine he's rolling. Uh, and I just don't see where Hyde fits in. So, yes, uh, if you got somebody out there you're really intrigued by, Cortland Sutton, for example, we're about to talk about one more time to remind everybody. Uh, if you got guys like that that are more intriguing, intriguing to you, yes, you can cut Carlos Hyde at this point, uh, which is devastating. Uh, he was such a monster for those four or six weeks, so hopefully he sold high before he got that trade in. Um, the other trade, again, the aftermath of Thomas leaving is it opens up even more targets for the number eight wide receiver in fantasy, Emmanuel Sanders. Already was the clear-cut number one, uh, but even more looks aren't going to hurt his value by any means. And then you also got Cortland Sutton, this very exciting rookie. Part of the reason they wanted to get rid of Thomas is because of how well Sutton's played, and they really wanted to give him a great opportunity. Eight, seven, nine, three, nine, three in his last four. So nothing just lighting the world on fire. Uh, but in the number three role of a not very explosive offense, he's been making plays week in and week out. And now he's going to have more shot each and every week. Only 13% owned. Got to be your number one waiver wire target, Cortland Sutton, this week. Uh, from there, we talked about Golden Tate going to the Eagles. His own value definitely takes a hit, at least for a couple weeks while he gets acclimated, learns the playbook. But again, I think a decent fit in Doug Peterson's offense overall. 
Um, the good predicated on the run after the catch screen opportunities is Doug Peterson's offense. So Golden Tate will be a nice natural fit there, but it will take a couple of weeks for him to get acclimated. Whereas he was the clear cut number one and firmly established with Detroit. His value definitely has to take a, a slight hit here. Even if Wentz is a better quarterback than Stafford, the volume is going to take a hit too, because this is a very loaded weapons cabinet here. Uh, what I'm worried most about is Zach Ertz. Uh, well, for one, Aguilar definitely goes down. He he sucks. Uh, he's already under 50 yards in all but one of his last six. So he already is terrible. Um, but ultimately, you know, he, he was cuttable before this. He's definitely cuttable now. But Zach Ertz, a guy that is very fantasy relevant, the number one tight end in fantasy right now, average 10 targets a game. That has to get eaten into by such a deep, inter- I mean, a uh, uh, humongous intermediate threat like Golden Tate, running 70% of his routes in between the numbers. Uh, we got 75% of routes for Zach Ertz in between the numbers. It's it's impossible for those two to not kind of eat each other's cheese as similar skill sets. Uh, you still got to love Ertz. He's still locked in tight end three, but the 10 targets per game that are just way above the rest of the league will probably come down to, to Ertz's usual seven or so per year, average of 7.2. I see that being right around where he'll hover uh, from here on out. Uh, and, and other than that, Alshon Jeffrey, just a different wide receiver, different route tree. I don't think he gets impacted too much other than a little bit less volume week to week, but he'll still maintain uh, quality wide receiver too. Maybe a little bit less. Uh, he had been that number one dominant wide receiver since returning. I, I think his shine's a little bit less, but nothing crazy. So Wentz, humongous upgrade for him. Aguilar already was cuttable. Get rid of his ass. Ertz and Alshon see a little bit of downgrades with more target competition. And uh, and then Tate himself learning a new playbook and more competition for targets takes a little bit of a hit himself as well. And the aftermath, a humongous riser, maybe the biggest riser of all of free agency, Mr. Kenny Galladay and also Marvin Jones. A very pass-heavy, volume-heavy Lions offense will now funnel through two guys instead of three. They run three-plus wide receiver sets on 75% of their plays, so I'm intrigued to see who becomes that next guy who steps in next. Uh, TJ Jones is produced when given the opportunities. Maybe Riddick goes to the slot, uh, or maybe it becomes more run-heavy and they just ride it out with Carrion Johnson, who's thrived these last few weeks. Um, so ultimately... Uh, I like those two wide receivers, Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, to see significant volume spikes. They're very talented guys that have been making the most of their limited opportunities. Uh, Galladay in particular, weeks one through five, wide receiver 15 with 15 points per game. Uh, was a monster, obviously fresh off two duds, but this is exactly what he needed to be freed. So Baby Tron can do it all. He's going to get that opportunity, and so will Marvin Jones. I think both very high-end wide receiver twos in light of this news last but not least actually definitely least Ty Montgomery uh, why should you give a shit that he's with the Ravens well one Buck Allen's been feasting in this pass catching goal line role that it seems like Montgomery was born to do he's a better version of Buck Allen so if he gets that Buck Allen role he's going to do better than Buck Allen who's been a decent RB2 for most weeks so you gotta enjoy uh, Montgomery at least as a speculative stash here uh, it could be end up being a three-headed nightmare and all three of him Collins and Buck are involved but I hope and I, I kind of foresee Montgomery coming in and taking that role uh, and being what Buck Allen was, just a better version of it, which would be definitely a usable flex from here on out. Worth the stash to see for a guy that's out there in 90% of leagues. And he leaves behind a very open now backfield for our guy Aaron Jones. Free Aaron Jones, I saw Matt Millican say, and I agree with you for sure. This guy's clearly the most explosive and talented guy there. Uh, so I'm, I'm a huge fan and... Uh, to, uh, to me, this now opens the door for more volume. Fresh off a 12-carry, 86-yard touchdown day, 32 season-high snaps, uh, six season low for Montgomery. This writing was on the wall. Uh, now it's even more so locked in to Aaron Jones's favor. Of course, Jamal Williams will still be disgustingly involved because he just sucks. But I, I think this is an up arrow for Ty, uh, Ty Montgomery, Aaron Jones, and even Jamal Williams. Um, other than that, uh, Ingram and Kamara like Matt. Who you were talking about there, Ingram and Kamara like? Uh, you got you got to remind me what I was talking about. Sorry, I zoned out. What do you think of Nick Chubb? Asks Jacob McMahon 
on uh, Instagram over here. Jacob, thanks for tuning in. I like Chubb. I mean, he's been rumbling. He's been rolling. What is he going to do in Freddie Kitchens' offense, the new offensive coordinator? That that's, waits to be seen, but Freddie Kitchens does have roots to Bruce Arians, uh, who's always been an absolute f- Facebook um just, I mean, <laughs> Facebook, sorry, mine, but a workhorse rider. He absolutely loves having those three-down horses used creatively in the passing games. So I like Nick Chubb. I think he's been, he'll be a quality RB2. I don't think this move uh, to Freddie Kitchen is going to hurt him. Maybe he gets Duke Johnson a little more involved. Uh, but those Bruce Arians ties, those workhorse history um, f- for Nick Chubb with Freddie Kitchens taking over. I like it. I think it's a positive for him. He's already been playing as a quality RB2, even low-end RB1, and has a nice schedule moving forward. Uh, so I-, I don't hate him at all. I think he's a quality, quality player. Um, other than that, Stephen Filipak on Facebook asking Powell. I-, I don't know what you mean by Powell. Let me know exactly what you're saying. That He's on the IR. Are you talking about Bilal? Uh, I don't know. Let me know. Um, but he also asked, does Watson become every week start from here on out? Sorry, I'm late. Uh, it depends on the matchup. Um, you're welcome, Jacob, as well. Depends on the matchup, Stephen. And don't apologize for being late. I appreciate you tuning in and asking some questions, interacting. Uh, I, I, most matchups, yes. I think depends on who you have as well. I know some people have like Mahomes and Watson. He's not an every week starter there because it's Mahomes is your every week starter. Uh, but ultimately. Yes, Watson most weeks should be locked in. I don't think his value is all that much different than when he had Fuller. In fact, he loses a very, you know, again, that lid lifter off the defense, that t- deep threat is not there anymore. Uh, so maybe this, it's definitely a positive to get Thomas to fill in, but they're still missing a crucial element there, that vertical element. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. But it definitely helps to, to have this guy and not go down just straight to QT. Um, so Watson, yeah, I, I think he's definitely a most weak starter in my opinion. Would you go after Sutton over QT on waivers now since the Mary's trade? Absolutely, Jordan, I would. Great question. I'm glad you asked it. But yes, Sutton to me, the clear-cut number two. Uh, and he's been making a lot of plays as just the number three. I think the volume spike is going to be real, and he's going to keep making plays. He has season changing upside down the stretch stretch run heroes emerge every year and i really think Cortland sutton has the potential to be that whereas qt falls to the number three option uh playing behind now demaris thomas who has a similar skill set to him he's banged up with a hamstring i'd much rather own uh Cortland sutton moving forward referring to your detroit receivers i think powell steps oh okay i got gotcha. you uh maybe it is maybe it's powell um and you have jared goff so yeah i'd probably most weeks rather have watson in there uh steven and my fan is, I think, T.J. Jones. I, what Jordan just pointed out, I like T.J. Jones personally. Uh, I think he's the one that stepped up when he's had the time. Maybe they put Riddick there. Who knows? But yeah, as you guys are all kind of alluding to, these lines, they use three wide receivers in 75% of their sets. So I don't expect them to just overhaul their entire offense and go you know, double tight end or anything like that. It's going to still be three wide receivers. Who is that third one going to be? He'll have some sleeper appeal. Sol TV asking, do you believe in Fitz Magic? I absolutely do, 100%. And it's not so much I believe in him, even though I do like Fitz Magic. He's the he's a fucking Harvard guy. You got to love the local boys. Uh, but I, what I love is this offense, the Todd Munkin air raid offense. It's just like a college team out there. They're by far the league leaders in passing yards per game at 376. That's over 60 yards uh, more than the Steelers, the next closest team. The Him and, and Winston, neither one of them have gone below 20 points through a complete start. Uh, Fitzmagic himself, first three starts of the year, and it really he's only three complete games, has thrown for over 400 yards in all three of them and three-plus touchdowns in all three of them uh, topping 30 points in two out of three. I mean, yes, I believe in Fitzmagic because this offense is so ridiculously pass-centric and that defense is so horrendously bad that they have to stay so ridiculously pass-centric. I love it all. So yes, I am a believer in Fitzmagic. The only worry is an in-game benching. How long is his leash going to be? Uh, those questions do exist. The risk is real. But while he's playing, there's very few quarterbacks that have that upside. In fact, his points per game trail only Patty Mahomes. Uh, crazy stat right there. Patty Mahomes, the only guy that's beating Ryan Fitzmagic in points per game. So yes, I am a believer in Fitzmagic. And if I was quarterback needy right now, then I would absolutely be throwing in a solid bid on the Fitzmagic man. Alrighty, guys. Looks like that's all the questions. We've kind of gone through that recap. Again, if you missed it, hopefully you can catch a, the replay of this. 
Uh, but at this point, I'm going to get caught up on a little bit of the writing, the stock watch. Let me know any and all questions you have. Again, this is the Wolf recapping the 2018 NFL trade deadline, those huge moves to Marius Thomas, Golden Tate, and then even Ty Montgomery. Uh, hopefully this recap helped you out. Let me know, again, any type of questions you have. How much do I spend on Cortland Sutton now? What is Ty Montgomery worth this, this roster spot over this guy? All that stuff. Let me know. Hit me up uh, at Roto Street Wolf on Twitter. And then, of course, on Instagram or Facebook. DM us. All that good stuff. Thanks again for tuning in, guys. Best of luck in Week 9.